So I'm, 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 I'm Jane Pugh, I'm a PKD patient and transplant recipient. Some of you also know me from, from the charity. So today I just want to talk to you a little bit about PKD and me, a sort of a little potted history. Um, my road to transplant, receiving the, the transplant, and a little bit about my, my time afterwards. I should say that this is a, a personal account. So it's not going to be everybody's experience. Um, you know, I'm sure there's, there are transplant recipients among, amongst us and your experience may be similar or it might be very different. It is also uh, pre-COVID, so it doesn't necessarily reflect the times that we, we currently live in. So PKD and me, I think we all know, I'm sure most of the audience know that PKD is, is genetic that there is a 50% chance of inheriting it from a affected parent. So in my family, we've been able to trace it back as far as my great grandmother on my dad's side, my grandmother and my dad. So my parents had four children and out of the four children, my sister, my elder sister and myself inherited PKD and my brother and my younger sister, thankfully, are, are free of the disease. The thing I should add as well is that the, my dad, my grandmother and my great-grandmother all sadly died at exactly the same age, obviously in different, in different times. So PKD and me, I was diagnosed in 1983, which just seems like a lifetime ago now. I can't quite do the math, I'm now 57. What, what is that, Susan? I'll get a pen and paper and do the maths for you, Jane. Thank you. You've just given away your age publicly. It's okay. <laughs> I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, so I, I, was, I was diagnosed in 1983. The reason for being screened was because there was a knowledge, there was a family history that, that, that we were aware of. Of course, not everybody with PKD. Have, I lo have you lost my screen? Has my screen yeah. disappeared? You've made to multi slides. So while you're sorting that, yeah. uh, one of our audience, one of the community actually has texted me your age. They're quick on the maths. It's a school teacher, right enough. And she calculated you to be 38. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless. That's really sweet. Thank you. Um, so I, I was screened because of the family history and because I was also experiencing some, some back pain. My GP referred me for a scan, um, which was a slightly different process back then than it is today. But that revealed that I had just a couple of cysts on, uh, on both of my kidneys. My reaction to the diagnosis was really bad. I, I, was, I was desperately frightened. I, I, I was actually quite, quite hysterical. I mean, I was, I, was only, I was only 19. I was there on my own. I had no family member. And I think also, having witnessed the effects on PKD on my dad, who'd only died two years earlier, so I was really still grieving. So that kind of magnified my feel, my fear, and my worry. Plus, also, there were no information leaflets at that time. There was no internet, and there was certainly no PKD charity. So there really was nowhere that I could go to 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 get the support that, that, that I needed. Um, and as a consequence, I felt like I'd been given a ticking bomb. And, and in, in the ensuing years, although really I, I had very few symptoms, this, just, just the knowledge, just knowing that I had this, this, this incurable condition that had caused the early deaths of three generations prior, and, and sort of sat in the background. I mean, outwardly, I appeared quite confident and quite okay, but there was this sort of nagging um, fear lurking really all of the time. I was quite lucky, I had few symptoms until pregnancy at the age of 32 when I was hospitalized with high blood pressure and preeclampsia. Of course, not everybody with PKD will develop problems during pregnancy. And of course, not everybody who's pregnant will develop preeclampsia. Nonetheless, it seemed it was clear that my, my kidneys were under strain due to the pregnancy which resulted in an assisted delivery. Post-pregnancy, I was then diagnosed with, with hypertension, with high blood pressure, and was, was put on medication. Things were okay for a while, 
until the age of 37 when I was diagnosed with brain aneurysm. So they, they, they found out that I had three. One of them was significantly large and I required um, a craniotomy, which is sort of open brain surgery. There's a photograph of me there. I do apologize if that offends anybody of um, me looking a little bit like Frankenstein. Um, the, this, this was a major operation and it took me quite a long time to, to, to recover, but, but I did. The remaining aneurysm was monitored for quite some years until a change in size and also the decline in my kidney function uh, led to further surgery. There was, there was some concern that I should have additional surgery prior to requiring dialysis and or transplant. Um, actually, that should say coiling. So this, the second surgery was, was through a procedure called coiling, which is much less invasive. That was in 2016. In, with regards to kidney function, my the, the more significant decline was really from the age of 40 onwards, fairly gradual, which of course does vary from person to person. So just as an example, we, we, you've, heard the, you've heard the talk today talking about um, creatinine. So if we look at 2015, when I'm now aged 51, my creatinine was at 206, which is a lot higher than it should be. But then over the course of the next couple of years, you can see that, that my creatinine level rose to, to, to 621 by the time I was admitted to hospital. Um, so as my creatinine rose, my function declined. Symptoms in the late stages were mostly so really bad night cramps, sort of so severe, I'd leap out of bed in, in, in quite a lot of pain. Um, lots and lots of problems with my feet, gout, bone fractures, fatigue, and a sort of strange morning retching that, was, that, that you hear people talking about. Despite all of that, uh, and by 2017, the whole of 2017, having an EGFR of six, which we had talked about, which kind of equates to almost like a 6%, uh, function, I did continue working full time. Um, and that included a long commute into, my, uh, into Manchester where I worked. And I was only actually activated on the waiting list in October 2017, despite having an EGFR of six. The reason for that is because I'd had trans, uh, aneurysm surgery the year before that had delayed the screening process. So by this point, by November 2017, I was close to being prepared for dialysis. I had a friend who had been screened as a, as a living donor that was about to be put into the live matching um, scheme. And then, and then out of the blue, one morning, it came, the call. We all know it as the call. Um, I remember the time well, because I was kind of just coming round um, to get up to go to work. Uh, Manchester number popped up on my, my phone and I kind of knew instantly really what it was. It was more instinct. And it was a call from the transplant coordinator, um, not, uh, not Mel, it was, a, it was a transplant coordinator at Manchester Royal Infirmary called Brian. And he informed me that a kidney had become available and did I want to accept? I had a, I had a choice of accepting or not. And of course I did. I think in terms of feelings at that point, I, it, they can perhaps best be described as I was shocked, I was disorientated, anxious and excited and paced around the house, not knowing what to do with myself. I was at home on my own um, and I was just ringing anyone I could think of. I uh, tried to call my son who was at university and actually nobody answered the phone. It was the most, most exciting thing that happened to me in a, in, a, in, in a long time and nobody answered. Thankfully, because I couldn't, drive myself to Manchester because it would have meant leaving my car there. Manchester Royal Infirmary organised, uh, the transplant coordinator rather, organised for a taxi that came and picked me up at home, drove me to, into the city, got stuck in, in traffic unfortunately, so that was a bit, that was a bit of a stressful moment. So I, I, I lived an hour, I live an hour away from Manchester. Arrived at the hospital, uh, transplant coordinator Brian met me there along with members of my family and friends that I've been able to get hold of in the meantime. As I say, this is, this is pre-COVID, so I was, I was very lucky. I think anybody going for a transplant now, it will, it's, it's, it'll be a much more challenging 
experience. The course of the day, we, we've heard about some of the tests that you have to go through when you arrive um, for transplants, blood, blood tests, chest, chest x-ray and, and, and so on to ensure that uh, I, was, I, was, I was still fit uh, for surgery. And I experienced a very, very long day, a long wait. Um, the 8th of November, 2017 was a, was a very long day because it, it really wasn't certain whether the transplant would, would go ahead. Um, and so there were a lot of mixed emotions for me. There was, there, was, it, there was desperate hope that it would happen, but equally, I also felt guilty, I felt guilty that, about the donor. I was also worried that my son wouldn't get home in time. I, I, I arranged for him to, to, to fly home, so that, that was great. So I knew he was on his way, but would he make it before the surgery went ahead? I really didn't know. Of course, it was a long way. I was nil by mouth, so no drink or, or food for about 28 hours, which I don't, I don't recommend, but it's kind of worth it in the end. Thankfully, the surgery did go ahead. Um, my, the, 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 the donated organ did arrive at some point in the night um, and was kept on ice for a while uh, or until, until the surgery, of course. And it, the surgery took place the next, next morning around 9 a.m. And I was in theatre for, for several hours and recovery and so on and arrived back to the ward about, about five o'clock. There's a photograph you can see here. There's lots of wires and, and which Hussein and some of the speakers have, have spoken about. And that is quite shocking at first. You know, it, 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 does, it, it is quite overwhelming to see all these tubes and, and things coming from you. Um, we talked about a, a pain relief, a PCA, patient controlled anesthesia, which is really fantastic. And I'd quite like to have one installed in my, in, in my bedroom when I can't sleep. Um, this is a, a, a little device that you press. Of course, it's, it's, it's restricted, so you, you, know, you can't overdose. Um, and then in the, in, in the sort of ensuing couple of days, I, I did experience nausea and vomiting, which is managed with, with medication. Um, lots of pain at the transplant site again, but you know, you, there is pain relief. Swollen legs, uh, quite significantly swollen. Uh, but the, the, all these things ease, started to ease after a couple of days. I was up and about quickly. Um, Mal and uh, Guy have explained about getting you moving, in particular at Manchester Royal Infirmary, they were very keen to get you up and about. And it sort of came a bit of a habit for me to sort of go for a little walk up and down the ward just to try and keep things moving, in particular bowels. But I won't, I won't go into that sort of detail here. We start to get immunosuppressants. We've talked about those. I won't lie. It, it was quite overwhelming to see, to see how many there were and to see the size of them as well. Some of the, um, the uh, uh, MMF in particular is quite a big tablet and that, that and, and getting used to the sort of routine is, is quite overwhelming, particularly when you're just recovering from surgery, but, but you, you do get that. Fortunately, my new kidney began working straight away, despite the fact that it, it actually had been out of the, the donor for quite a few hours, we got a good result quite quickly. Um, so start producing urine, creatinine levels started to fall. So just to give you an idea of what that looked like, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, my creatinine on admittance on the 8th of November was 621. And a couple of weeks later, my creatinine had, had fallen to 218. And I think, I think it's important to remember that everybody's experience here will be different. Some people will experience a much more rapid fall in, in creatinine. Other people will experience uh, a, a slower fall. As Hussein has already mentioned, sometimes kidneys can be sleepy. They can take a while to, to wake up. There is a tendency, of course, to become obsessed with those figures. So post-transplant, I was in hospital. I came home after seven days and no driving, uh, no di driving allowed for six weeks. But I was very lucky that I had family and friends that could run me to clinic, which, as I say, was an hour away from where I lived attended transplant clinic twice a week initially, where I had my bloods taken, blood pressure, weight, and so on. And any adjustments to medication were, were made at, at that stage. I took six weeks off work and then returned back to my job uh, in, in the city initially on a phase return. 
and uh, after about four weeks I was I was back to to to, to full-time work three months on I was repatriated to my local renal center at Preston where I was very very lucky because they have a, a Preston, and again, this might be different across the country, they have a dedicated um, post-transplant team. And what that means is you, you see the same consultant every time, you see the same um, nurse practitioners. So they get to know you, they get to, they get to understand some of your fears and, 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 and so on. Um, so that, 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 that sort of worked really, really well. Um, things were going, going quite well. Six months post transplant, I started to develop infections, which really sort of ran on in that first year. I was I was rehospitalized about three times, and I think sort of on a, on a more of an emotional level, I, I I probably was still quite overwhelmed that that I'd been lucky enough to receive the transplant pre pre dialysis, um, whereas my elder sister was on dialysis and had quite a tough time for, for seven years before she received her transplant in 2015. I also then started to experience some, some emotional disturbances. We, we, we heard earlier from um, renal psychologist, uh, Dr. Nicola Reed. Um, the emotional disturbances were really a combination of some of, some of the sort of PKD related anxieties that had been going on for a number of years. And, and also some, some stuff that happened post-transplant, so the culmination of a range of factors. Fortunately, I, my, my post-transplant team at Preston sort of recognised that there was, there was some problems going on for me. I talked quite openly about it, and I was referred to a renal psychologist um, who I saw regularly for about 12 months, and it made a, a, a huge difference uh, to me in also dealing with some of the sort of general PKD related stuff that I've been carrying around for quite a while. Since then, so where, where am I? Well, what, what's happened in, in, in the time since? The cramps that I described earlier have, have thankfully disappeared completely. Uh, I have a lot more energy. And I think when I look back now to my time pre-transplant, getting up at six o'clock in the morning, traveling into Manchester every day, which took me about an hour and a half, two hours with an EGFR of six, I think I was probably a lot more tired than, than, than I realized when I compared to how I, am, how, how I am now. I also discovered Pilates, which has been absolutely fantastic for my mind and body. Although of course, because of COVID, I've not done that for a year and my body is, is starting to show the signs of, of that, sadly. I did uh, celebrate my, kid, my first kidney anniversary, which was a huge milestone and, and is for any, anybody that post-transplant. We've heard a little bit about some of the challenges in that first year of transplant. I was put onto a prophylactic antibiotic, which I've been on for the last three, well, three years to keep in, uh, infections at bay, which isn't, isn't entirely uncommon. Although actually I've just, just come off that now the last couple of days, my consultant wants to try me without. I think one of the things that, that is quite specific to PKD, although not everybody, is that I, I still have a sense, I'm still aware of, of having a, a new kidney. I think the comp having two very large PKD kidneys and, and a third kidney kind of tucked in, um, I'm very aware of that presence. And sometimes it can still be quite uncomfortable to get into the right sleeping position. I love my new kidney I, and, I, and it, this might sound a bit weird, but I, you know, I, I, I do feel a strong affection for him. I, I, I talk to him, I say, you know, good morning, how are you? And, and, and that sort of thing, which possibly makes me sound like a nutcase, but um, I, it, it's, it's, it's a bond that you, you, that you, you kind of develop for, for, for most people. I do have um, what's classed as a stable kidney function. I have an EGFR of between, that hovers between 38 and 40. Some people get a much, much, much more improved EGFR than, than that. Others possibly slightly less. Again, there is a tendency to obsess about these things and do, do lots of comparisons. I wrote my thank you letter to my donor family. It took me ages to write it. It actually took me 16 months to write it. I think there was a lot of reasons for that. One being I started to get infections and there was a sense of 
Am I tempting fate? If I write to say it's doing well, uh, I also struggle to find the right words. And there's a whole host of reasons. Nonetheless, I, I did sit down one day and I wrote it and it felt great to do that. That was coordinated through, through the, the transplant team. I haven't heard from the family, but it doesn't matter. It just, uh, it just feels good just being able to say, just being able to say thank you. I've also had a change of career. I'm no longer schlepping into Manchester every day. I've been given the opportunity to bring my professional experiences as well as my personal to, to work with the PKD, PKD charity, which I've been doing for the last couple of years. And it's been fantastic. It's been a fantastic time. And finally, how am I doing for time? Not too bad, actually. I think I've got through that quite quickly. Um, so just from me, again, other people will give you other, other pieces of, of, of advice, but I think the things that I've learned over the last three years is that the question of how long is the transplant going to last? I think it's always going to lurk in the background, background for, for anybody that's had a transplant. I mean, there may be some that have some golden, golden nugget for, for, for not having that thought. But what I have learned is, is not to obsess over the results. I, I do remember in the early days, you know, as so, soon as I'd had my bloods, I was kind of onto patient view to see, uh, patient access rather, to see the, um, the results. Whereas now I'm a little bit more relaxed about it and also realise that fluctuations in our, in, in our readings are actually quite normal. Mild fluctuations are very normal. Um, and to trust the doctors, trust in your doctors, but also know your body, get to, get to understand your body and its little nuance, nuances and raise concerns if you've got them and become as informed as, as possible as you can. You know, attend events like this, for example. Get a seven day pillbox, we've mentioned this already, and an alarm on your phone to tell you when to, to remind you when to take your meds. Keep moving even if it's just a walk, just to walk around the block, a, a slow walk, a fast walk, but just try and keep moving as much as possible. Uh, Humour. I think when I look back to, as a, to a, that 19 year old that was completely freaked out at being diagnosed with PKD and all the challenges along the way, the brain surgeries and the renal failure and kidney transplant and so on. One of the things that have sort of kept me sane has just has been able to find the humour, find the humour in most situations and sort of kind of laugh in the face of adversity to, to, to some extent. I know it's not easy, uh, not always anyway. And also to focus on the now. We've talked about mindfulness um, and, you know, look at, look at the positive things and really no matter how short-lived a transplant may be, because we know it's not a cure, we know they're not going to last forever, um, they are really freeing for the time that you have them despite, despite lockdown and all those restrictions that we've all had to live with for the last year. And then finally, whenever I have any doubts, I always sort of, sort of look towards one of my favorite mantra, uh, mantras, uh, which is, you know, it'll, it'll be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not yet the end. I'm gonna leave you to think about that one. And that's me. Any questions? <clears throat> Thank you, Jane, for your open and courageous talk. <laughs> As you said, everybody's journey is different. <clears throat> Although I'm sure some of the things you've said will resonate with those of us who've been through it as well. Um, quite a few people just thanking you in the chat. Uh, somebody saying they're going to be talking to theirs. Uh, I don't think we've had any specific questions about about your experience, but uh, we can always answer those at the end. That's great. I thought I was, Thank I'm you. Just, I'm just grateful that nobody asked me to show my scar because <laughs> I, I do have a photo. If anybody really wants to see it, you can email me at. No. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>